everyone and welcome to the Babli webinar. Uh, this is our first webinar for the speech language expert community and we're very excited that you uh, joined us for our first webinar of many. My name is Eva Brunitz and I'm a research scientist with Babli uh, with a background in neuroscience and psychology. So um, one thing that really motivated us to put uh, together this webinar series and to start this conversation was that we've been working on a deep dive study trying to make sense of the different sources of language milestones um, in trying to be as evidence-based and as science-based as we possibly can be. So science is hard, um, but it also relies primarily on recognizing patterns in the world, patterns in the data, and making sense of those patterns. And one pattern that we um, came up against again and again um, was this pattern or notion of variability. Um, and it's something that we're all concerned about, this balance between um, normal variability and recognizing that each child is on their own language development trajectory with their own sort of journey and potential markers of language delay. Parents are often the first to suspect that there is a language delay. Um, and so um, to sort of support that parental intuition, it's important to think about where they turn to try to find information about um, their child's development. So we know that parents are really keen to find information, but it's not always easy. Um, a recent survey in the last few years uh, showed that 65% of millennial parents seek out information on language and communication online. So parents are trying to find that information and to bridge that gap between their concerns and expert understanding. Um, but we know from our own user research, uh, our own internal data, that uh, 68 percent, so the vast majority of parents of uh, children with speech and language delays, agreed that getting an accurate assessment of their child's development stage was a significant challenge. So there's this gap that needs to be bridged between um, expert opinions and expert knowledge and parental intuitions. At Babli, we try to bridge that gap in one way, um, which is by providing parents with real-time data on their baby's babbling skills. So um, in case you're not familiar with the app yet and you're curious about it, it's available on both the Android and app, uh, Apple app stores. Um, and it is a mobile app that provides parents with real-time data on the stage of um, babbling that um, provides parents real-time data on their uh, baby's babbling stage, um, as well as um, how their baby's uh, skills and babbling progression compares to their age benchmarks. Um, the app also contains activities that were designed with the help of speech language pathologists um, to kind of help support uh, get children to their next milestone. So our app measures the occurrence of four different babbling types, which we'll get to in just a second. Um, and uh, also the number of turns that are taken in parent-child interactions. So this is relatively few data points to what an expert such as a speech language pathologist might consider when making a holistic assessment of a child's language development. But we focus on expressive language for a couple of reasons. So why measure babbling? What is it about babbling? It's not just a readout of current ability. It's not just a readout of a baby's skills at a given time point. It's also a very good window into potential or possible trajectories in the future. What I mean by that is that um, earlier babbling, so babies who start babbling earlier on in their life and who babble more are also likely to start talking in proper words earlier. Um, we also know that delays in canonical babbling uh, relate to smaller vocabularies at 18 and 24 months of age. So both of these data points pointing to the fact that um, Babbling is not just a readout of current ability, it's um, also a predictor or at least an indicator of um, what is likely to how a particular infant's language development is likely to progress. Babbling is also very difficult to measure by just asking parents, because uh, there's a lot of different aspects to it that are hard to um, understand intuitively. And this is where um, and report on intuitively. And this is where the pattern recognition machine can really uh, get to shine. So how the app works is by using artificial intelligence or machine learning to detect vocalization patterns. But very simply, um, the app classifies infant vocalizations into four different classes. 
Um, the parents upload a video or audio with the baby's voice into the app, um, and then this recording gets um, fed into the Babbly AI algorithm. So what this algorithm does is take this takes this new video and compares it to its training data set. So the set of of um, vocalizations that have been labeled, and so um, it compares this new um, newly received uh, video to this library of existing labels and tries to find ones that match it most closely. And then what the parents see um, back in the app is feedback on what types of babbling uh, were most likely to be present in a given recording. So so um, options being cooing, single syllable babbling, duplicated babbling, and variegated babbling. So um, this is a classification assessment, um, but it's not a, an assessment of how this um, particular how a particular infant skills relate to the benchmarks or um, every other infant of their age. For this, we need to look at benchmarks. So we need to look at um, the literature and have a better sense of how the different sources um, actually define the different benchmarks at different ages. And so we reviewed as much literature as we could find to actually get a sense of what was going on um, and to construct the sort of normative data and what might be expected at every given age. So we spent quite a bit of time trying to make sense of the literature, and we looked at 21 sources in total, of which 13 were primary research articles, so um, uh, research uh, primarily from academic sources, and eight were milestone guidelines that are primarily intended for parents and practitioners. Um, examples of these include CDC milestones, um, SAC milestones, as well as ASHA guidelines. And um, we took the um, each of these sources, and we took the data from the um, each of the guidelines that we found and compiled it for each babbling type that was mentioned in each source. So this allowed us to construct the graph that you can see on the left side of your screen here, um, where um, it's showing the distribution of ages at which different babbling types are observed. So on the horizontal axis, we're showing age and months ranging from zero to 24. And on the vertical axis, we have the proportion or a percentage of sources that observed, that reported observing a given babbling type at each month of age. So essentially in practice, what we can do is take these curves to infer how likely it is for a baby to develop a given skill at a given month of age. If we take the example of single syllable babbling shown here in yellow, we can assume that the majority of infants will develop single syllable babbling by six months of age. The reason for this is that that's where the peak of the distribution is, an increasingly smaller proportion will develop single syllable babbling earlier and later in age. More broadly, what this graph shows is that there's a sort of progression um, in age moving from simpler forms of babbling, such as cooing and single syllable babbling, to more complex um, uh, multifaceted forms of babbling, such as duplicated and variegated uh, babbling, and these also have a bit more overlap. So we can take these data to be our normative data set. So this is what is likely to happen for an average child. And so on the next slide, I'll show you how the Babley AI classification results um, align with these curves. So I'll plot the data in the same way. I'll replot these normative data, uh, but now against our AI's results. So which babbling patterns are most likely to be classified at each age? So. Um, looking at this here, so these are the normative data are shown in the dashed lines and our AI outputs are shown in the solid lines um, using the same color scheme as before. And we can see that all the categories are showing quite a good fit. Um, there's a bit more variability in variegated babbling where the two curves do not overlap quite as much as with other sources. Um, but in general, it suggests that the AI is identifying utterance types at each age mostly correctly. So the outputs are likely to be correct. Um, but what this is not showing is that the AI is identifying typical versus delayed babbling. So this is worth noting. But if we take a step back and go back to what I was just saying about how many sources we looked at and the process of looking and combining all these data from for the normative curves, um, we noticed that there was a ton of variability in the normative sources themselves. So the sources that 
were provided some authoritative data on um, when different milestones are expected to be observed themselves had a, a lot of variability. So this variability actually maps onto the data from the app that we can see here really nicely. So it's not that the age ranges themselves are off or not representative of what happens in the real world, but if you're a parent and you're trying to get a clear cut answer on what is happening at each age and whether a child is likely to be on a delayed language development trajectory, that can be very confusing. What does this variability um, mean for parents? So back to this pattern of variability, we wanted to really delve deep into it and try to understand where the variability is coming from and um, what the sources of confusion are most likely to be. So um, we decided to do a deep dive on five different sources of truth uh, when it comes to language development milestones. And in particular, we focused on skills that were framed as red flags. So while this is a term we try not to use, um, it is commonly used um, and um, it can cause concern to parents because it um, really highlights that action needs to be taken. But these are especially important for that same reason. They're a call to action. If a given skill is not accomplished by a given age, um, this is a cause to contact um, or uh, ask for a referral to a speech language pathologist. So um, we considered five sources that are uh, generally quite accessible to parents. Two of these were more speech language pathologist focused, um, namely um, ASHA and the Hannon Center. And three of these are more pediatric focused, namely the Centers for Disease Control, American Asso Association of Family Physicians, and the look-see checklist by the Nipissing Developmental District screen. So all the data will be shown in this plot here. It's intentionally blank at the moment. Um, and I know there's quite a bit of information on this slide. So what we're showing here on the left, each of these is an individual red flag um, as indicated by at least three of these five sources. And on the horizontal axis here, we again have H and months. So we're not gonna go through each individual red flag, but I will be showing the overlap in the age ranges that are considered um, cause for concern or there are calls to action for each of the sources. So if all five sources agreed perfectly on when a given skill should occur or it's cause for concern, then there would be perfect overlap between these sources. As you might have guessed, that's not the case. Um, and instead, there's a lot of variability. So there are a few red flags that tend to be agreed upon in terms of their age ranges. But for the vast majority of them, the age ranges are either very different in length or different in amount of overlap. Um, either way, if even just looking at two of them could cause um, confusion and concern. So let's zoom in on two scenarios um, out of many more, I'm sure, that could cause confusion to parents. So the first scenario is that the skill itself is clearly defined, um, but the different sources provide different age ranges for when it's considered to be concerning. So the way this plot works is by looking at the first age at which a red flag is mentioned relative to the last age at which it's not mentioned. So the assumption here is that the skill must develop at the latest between those ages. And if there's no range, then, then no lower bound was given. So of course, um, in line with our um, focus on babbling, uh, we focused on this does not babble red flag. And what we can see here is that um, if a baby is not babbling by approximately seven months, this is very much um, a cause for concern according to the ASHA guidelines, but it's well, it's still outside the um, range of concern according to the CDC guidelines. Um, and it wouldn't necessarily be considered a concern based on one source, but it may be considered quite a concern based on another source. Um, so this can cause anxiety to parents not knowing where to turn and who to trust out of these sources. But even here, I said that the flag, the red flag itself is defined clearly and it's very cut and dry, but it's not. There are gray areas. So do these sources refer to single syllable babbling or duplicated babbling or even variegated babbling? Um, sometimes this is clear in the guidelines and sometimes it's implied. Um, so where an expert would be able to read between the lines, a parent is likely not to be not be able to do so. Either way, it's much more complex for parents. 
Another possible source of confusion is a scenario where the same phrasing is used for a red, given red flag, but it's clear that it has different meanings. Um, and when I say clear, I mean it's clear to the experts that it has different meanings. So if we take this example of does not respond to own name, um, it's, it's unclear whether it refers to looking at the caregiver, head turning toward the source of sound, non-verbally responding, or verbally responding. So this is a scenario where a speech language pathologist would of course know what is expected at a given month of age, but it's much more confusing um, and this vague wording can cause parents anxiety and confusion. So in fact, it comes up twice in the same source. So it's not an error that we see two yellow bands here. It is mentioned twice in the look-see checklist um, and the wording is um, practically identical, but it's unclear on first glance what the difference would be. So with all that said, it's easy to see how confusion and frustration might arise. And these were just two scenarios of many um, by comparing just a few sources of uh, milestones. So this brings us back to this challenge that we all know about, which is the striking the right balance between waiting and seeing and um, differences in how quickly different children develop different skills and understanding that each child is on their own uh, language development journey. But with the caveat and understanding that waiting for too, waiting too long can result in late diagnosis and intervention and can have knock-on effects later on down the line. The um, con converse approach is taking uh, concrete guidance on concrete actions uh, as provided by these red flags, but this framing can cause a lot of anxiety, shame, and guilt, and if the sources don't perfectly agree on when the red flags um, occur in terms of age, um, it can also provide a lot of um, confusion in terms of when exactly um, action needs to be taken and a speech language pathologist needs to be contacted. So at Babbly, we our goal is to empower parents to adopt a more naturalistic play-based approach, and we wanna move away from focusing so much on milestones and building a supportive um, parent-child dynamic. And this dynamic working towards supporting um, the child's develop speech and language development. So with um, that, um, I would like to thank you all for taking the time uh, to attend the seminar. If um, you're interested in, in following our science, please um, have a look at our website. We also publish new findings um, and new thoughts on our blog, um, as well as our social media handles. And if you'd like to get in touch, please write to us at hello at babbly.co.